Welcome everyone to our first book release party, Your Next Adventure with the Colony Group. We'll get started in just one minute. Thank you for joining us. Okay, a very warm welcome everyone. Thank you all for joining our very first book, book club release as part of Worth's Lives with our partners from the Colony Group um, where we're celebrating the publication of their advisor's new book, Your Next Adventure, Planning for Life After the Sale of Your Business. Firstly, I hope you and your loved ones are keeping well during these unusual times. I'm Juliet Scott Croxford, CEO at Worth Media and, and your moderator for the next hour. And I'm delighted to be joined by the authors of your next adventure, Marshall Road, Jim Fitz and John Weeks. Hi, everyone. Oh, hi. So many of us have been impacted by this global health pandemic and many are still responding and recovering from the crisis as well as pivoting their businesses. Um, our focus at Worth is to engage and connect our community and partners with inspiring and informative content and conversations that are relevant to your lives and the world that we're now living in, so that we can offer advice and support and insights and resources. And the Worth Live Book Club is a way to connect our community through new publications and topics uh, with authors and, and with many of you who are also authors and writers yourselves. Our first book launch, uh, which is incredibly exciting, is Your Next Adventure, a book focused on the process of transitioning the ownership and management of a family or closely held business. And we're delighted to have the authors from the Colony Group, Marshall, Jim, and join with us to share their perspectives on transitioning ownership of your business and also the process that they went through um, in authoring this book. So a few housekeeping rules before we get started. This is a conversation. Um, we, we really do welcome questions from you. Um, attendees are, are muted on entry into the session. Um, but if you use your chat function at the bottom of your screen, um, you can type your question in there directly to me, Juliet Scott Croxford. Um, and I can either unmute you so that you can ask your question directly. Um, or if you'd prefer to stay anonymous, that's totally fine. And we'll weave it into the conversation as we go. So let's get started. Um, this is our first book launch, um, Your Next Adventure. Firstly, just a personal check-in with everyone. How are you all doing personally and how, how are you managing your, your, your well-being during these un unusual times? Jim, why don't we start with you? Sure, thank you, Juliet. Thank you for having us. Um, well, I think it's, it's important to maintain some level of routine uh, and whether or not we're working remotely as we are or whether you're working in the office, uh, we're doing pretty much the same kind of things, interacting with clients. So I think that's important. Um, but by the same token, you know, these are unusual times. And so um, I'm fortunate enough to live in rural New Hampshire and I get outside a lot and uh, enjoy the outdoors. I take time to exercise regularly and just be mindful of how lucky I am to you know, be healthy and my family is healthy and um, we're still able to serve our clients. So I think just a, a culture of appreciation and, and um, you know, getting outside and not, not getting, you know, too worked up about the things you can't do. Think about all the things that you can do. And Marshall, how, how have you been, how have you been spending this time? Well, thank you, Juliet. And I'm trying hard to stay connected with my kids. One is in Chicago and the other is in Boston. And although we have always been able to FaceTime or Zoom, uh, it's never been more important since we don't get to spend physical time together. So it's, it's really been a time of thinking about connections with family and with friends and, and working thoughtfully about how to do that. That, that's, uh, to me, been a big part of this experience. And, and, and John, hi, w welcome to you as well. How, how are you doing? Um, and also, if you wouldn't mind just, just starting with also how, how have your professional and personal experiences led you to authoring this book? Because you, sure. you ran a family business, right? Sure, yes, yes. Uh, so thanks, Julia. Great to be here with everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, so I'm, I'm on uh, week 10 of work from home. So 
uh, sort of uh, been settled in here in my uh, my office, my home office. But like many of you out there, uh, I've I've probably had an over reliance on uh, too much food and certain beverages to sort of get me through every day. Uh, we created a, a workout area in our basement, and I pulled out my 10-year-old P90X workout DVDs and trying to get at those, and also confirmed that, uh, once again, that I don't look good with a beard, a mustache, or long hair. So um, so those are the things that have sort of worked their way through uh, as uh, as I've worked from home. And, uh, and there are signs of life, you know, signs that things are starting to come back, so that's encouraging. So... Um, with that just uh, connection to the book and experience, uh, yes, as you mentioned, I grew up in a family business. It's a business my grandfather started. My dad and his brothers took it over, ultimately sold it, but, um, but that was my early experience, just seeing what they went through and uh, the commitment that that took. Uh, early in my career, I was a commercial banker helping business owners grow the value of their businesses transitioned over to wealth management where, you know, saw the, the uh, you know, what came out of the sale of a business and helping the business owner uh, in that, uh, in those areas uh, that we'll talk about more today. And, uh, and then um, after getting out of banking, I, I joined a business owner, Marshall Rowe, who uh, started his own business and uh, uh, has had tremendous success. And uh, so it's been uh, good to be by his side for the last 10 years almost. Um, and, and I just wanted to say welcome to anyone that, that, that's joined a few minutes late. Um, we're here with the authors of the book, Your Next Adventure. Um, we're joined by Marshall, Jim and, and John. So welcome everyone. And, and please do share questions um, using the chat function to me, Juliet Scott Croxford. Um, so Jim, th so this, this is the book, Your Next Adventure. What was the goal in writing this book? And, and was there any particular mission you were you were hoping to accomplish by writing it? I think we had, you know, a couple couple missions in, in writing it. Um, you know, my background was similar to John's and that I've been on both um, the business side of, of supporting businesses and also the personal side. And we've seen a lot of uh, successful transitions and not so successful transitions. You know, Colony's mission is to give our clients peace of mind so they can find joy and meaning in their lives. And when you have something as important as a family owned business that you transition out of, um, if it doesn't go well, it's the opposite of peace of mind. When you don't plan properly, um, you don't anticipate what kind of things can happen to you and your family, um, then I won't say your world can fall apart, but you've got some real rocky roads ahead of you. So while our experience uh, is certainly available to our clients, our mission in writing this book was to share it more broadly uh, with business owners <clears throat> across the country so uh, they would have a greater odds of success when they transition their business. Um, the other mission that we had was we have very close professional relationships with a lot of <clears throat> um, partners, professional partners, CPAs and attorneys and other, um, other professionals that serve the business community and we also find that they sometimes struggle with their clients uh, in helping them succeed in a transition. So we wrote this book also for our, um, our professional partners. So they in turn could help their clients uh, with the, you know, the experience that we've had uh, be more successful in their transitions. And Marshall, what are some of the key points that you make in the book? Just um, give us a sort of a, a brief synopsis. Well, I think, I think it begins with the idea of a timeline, and we encourage business owners to start years before they anticipate the transaction or the transition. We talk about T minus five, transaction minus five years as a good place to start. And so starting early is certainly important, but then there are really five personal elements which are impacted by the sale of a business, which a business owner has spent his life focused on. And those five personal elements include the social structure of their life, their family relationships, their intellectual framework, their health and fitness, and of course their financial life. And so we try and address each of those elements in the book and provide really some useful ideas and an approach that business owners can 
utilize to, to think about their own circumstances and what will be success for them. And at the start of the book, um, it, I mean, it's, it's, an, it's, an, it's full of so many incredible insights, this book. And at the start, you, you talk about transitioning your business. Um, and John, you talk about business owners transitioning from managing and operating a company to managing a financial company after the sale of the business. What, what do you mean by that? So when you think about a business owner and what, uh, what they're involved with on a day-to-day -day basis uh, in running their business, I mean, there's finance, there's human resources, sales, marketing, all these different aspects. Um, it all goes into creating this successful business that is uh, creating value for themselves, the asset that itself, but also that's their paycheck. I mean, they're getting, you know, every week or whenever they get paid, that's, that's how they live, that supports their lifestyle. And when they go through the transition, the ownership of their business, when they, when they uh, turn that, uh, you know, closely held illiquid asset, usually into a very liquid asset, cash, uh, you know, you've got to manage that cash much like, or think about managing that cash much like you thought about managing the business. It will be the engine that uh, supports your lifestyle, your family's lifestyle, legacy, other things that we're going to talk about today. So just as it's important to have the right advisors to be looking at the right aspects um, that are driving your business, you got to look at that engine that will be supporting you um, in a similar way. While it's similar in some ways, it's different in many other ways. And, you know, we spend a lot of time sort of looking at that overlap of the personal and the business. And as it starts to come apart, you need to look at the components that are going to stay with the business and then the others that are going to be outside of the business that are coming with the owner, with the family. And how are you going to control those? How are you going to manage those? And one example of that is just, uh, you know, health insurance, you know, it's health insurance provided by the company. And if you sell that company, uh, usually there's that separation. What are you going to do? Where are you going to get it from? You used to be able to go in and, you know, you had an HR person and they took care of that. Well, you know, they're not there anymore. And so uh, who is it that's going to provide it? How is it going to be provided? And the real eye opener for many is, you know, the cost of things like that, that uh, again, were sort of, they were just part of the business. And uh, now guess what? It's part of your personal business that you've got to run yourself. So, uh, so that's, that's what we talk about there. Thank you. And, and I just wanted to say welcome to everyone. Um, a, a few additional people have joined. Th thank you. This is our very first book club release as part of Worth Live with our partners from the Colony Group. And we're celebrating the publication of their advisor's new book, Your, your Next Adventure and Planning for Life After the Sale of Your Business. So delighted to have Marshall Rowe, Jim Fitz and, and, and John Weeks with us. Um, just moving on, there's a, a meant, there's a concept in the book around the three clocks. Marshall, what's that all about? Because I found that very intriguing and it really speaks to that, the, the, the sort of personal and professional aspects of thinking about the sale of your business. Yeah, the, the concept of three clocks really tries to look at, at the broad picture that a business owner is facing. And the, the premise is that for an ideal transition, you want all three clocks to be aligned. And the first clock is the industry clock, meaning that an ideal time to transition or sell a business is when your industry's economics are strong, there's good growth in the industry. In particular, there are high multiples being paid for business in the industry. That's, that's an ideal time to think about selling or transitioning your business. So that's the first clock. The second clock is the business itself, meaning that is the business ready to be sold? Do you have a good management team in place? Or do you have good margins? Has your growth rate been persistently good? Do you have a diverse customer mix or client mix? Or do you have an over-concentration risk? Thinking about getting your business ready to be sold and making sure that your financials are in good shape and that you have audited financials. It's just the preparation of the business and making sure that it's running well and your management team is in place so that you have a good asset that you're, you're essentially putting up for sale. The third clock is the one that we primarily focus on in the book, and that's 
you, the business owner, and your family. And what we've seen many times and many of the advisors that we work with, whether they're corporate attorneys or M&A bankers or uh, the other CPAs, accountants associated with the business, is that often the industry is obviously leading its own life. The business owner has run a good business. That's what he's focused his life and passion on. But the family may not be ready for, as John was just saying, this uh, operation which produces a lot of cash, may employ members of the family, plays a big role in the life of the family. And if they, as well as the owner, are not ready for this transition, it's probably the single most prevalent reason why transactions don't take place or why they fail at the 11th hour is that the family is not ready for the transaction. And that comes back to why we wrote the book. We're trying to make sure that the family is ready and prepared for the transaction so that the family clock can align with the business clock and the industry clock. And that really leads to a successful transaction. And, and uh, it, it surprised me that the, the family clock, that the readiness, the family readiness, the, the sort of preparation for this is, is kind of actually start to think about this five years ahead of when that, when that transition might take place, right? That's, that's correct because you're, you're talking about family expectations. Um, the reality of family members working in a business, those dynamics may change. You, if you're developing leadership in your company, if you are thinking about your next adventure, which is uh, the business owner's life after the, the transaction, it all takes time. And we've, we, part of the, the, the motivation to write the book was our experience with business owners who did not take the time to plan well in advance. And we've seen the outcome of that. And often it's not a, a, a pleasant experience for the business owner or their family. And it can lead to very unfortunate circumstances for the family as well as the business owner if they don't plan and really take the time to plan in advance. And, and we'll come into some of the some of those sort of examples that have that have been positive and and not so positive later on in the talk. Um, two areas that interested me um, uh, sort of one was very relationship driven, and the other one was around uh, the role of giving back. Jim, how can philanthropy philanthropy play a, a role in a successful transition? I think you know in a couple ways. Um, First of all, the philanthropic intent has to be, you know, has to exist within the family and the business owner themselves. It's not very often that a business owner who has no philanthropic intent and no experience with philanthropy will all of a sudden become a philanthropist, you know, upon the sale of the business. But most of the clients that we work with, uh, most of the people that we know in this field that are business owners have already um, started to give back while they've been business owners. The difference is, is that upon um, a liquidity event, upon the transition of, the, of a business, um, there's a substantial additional capacity for significant philanthropy than there was before. That's not to say that some business owners aren't very philanthropic and, and very generous uh, in their charitable giving while they are business owners, but the majority of the value that the family has is generally tied up in the equity in the business. And so when a transition occurs and that, um, that equity is monetized, the substantial amount of, liqu of liquidity that, that all of a sudden becomes available, that changes the capacity for the business owner to, um, to further and realize the family's philanthropic intent. Um, that creates um, obviously resources and opportunity um, but also creates challenges. Um, you know, most of most people that um, go through uh, or are, are terribly inclined during their work lives aren't necessarily that strategic, unless there's a great deal of wealth in the family. They don't tend to be um, very strategic in their giving. Um, and all of a sudden, when there's a tremendous amount of capacity, the opportunity for being strategic comes into play. Um, when businesses transitioned, 
um, you know, there'll be a lot of people lined up um, helping you, wanting to help you figure out what you can do with all that liquidity. Um, all good intention, but it, it's valuable for the family to really think strategically about what they want to accomplish with their philanthropy so they can be very targeted with it and they don't go off in a bunch of different directions that may not have um, the impact they're looking for or the staying power that they do. So I would say uh, the first one is just a question of capacity and, and enabling the philanthropic intent that the business owner already has. Of course, the second um, opportunity for philanthropy comes in tax mitigation. Um, you know, a transition does create generally a large tax liability. And if uh, there are thoughtful um, charitable structures that can be put in place um, during the transition, prior to the transition, if you plan enough ahead, um, that can make a significant difference in the tax liability that's directly associated with the sale of the business. Um, if a family is charitably inclined and they intend to um, continue to be charitably inclined for the balance of their lives, they've got a long future in front of them of philanthropy. And with that liquidity that is created at the time of a transition, uh, there's the opportunity to fund into the future a lot of that future, uh, future philanthropy. I also thought it was nice where um, it, it, it can also be used as a vehicle to sort of bind the family and dif different generations of the family together. That's something that's very common and it touches on another theme that we have in the book and that's how the relationships change once um, a business has been sold and Marshall touched on this. Um, the role of the business owner and the family changes, the relationships between the family members change. Um, the identity of the business owner and even the identity of some of the extended family may change when the business is no longer associated with a family. Um, that can create some upheaval. Um, and we have found that philanthropy is a common way that we can continue to help the family come together around a common goal. The business created that common goal in the past, but with the business gone, philanthropy can often um, fill that void. And, and John, how important is, um, is, the, is the business owner's spouse or partner? And, and, and how is that such a, why is that so critical in, in a successful transition? Well, I think family communication, uh, family relationships uh, are, are a big part of what we talk about in the book. And, and uh, you know, it starts really with the spouse. And how that relationship uh, during the business owning years is uh, is a distinct relationship. It uh, it may in, and likely involves a lot of discussion between the two uh, about what's going on in the business, the future of the business, um, as they start to think about what the next adventure might look like. Uh, the communication becomes even more. Uh, important, more critical to the success of it because uh, you sell your business and you now come home, you have free time. How are you going to fill that time? You're seeing somebody maybe a lot more than you've ever seen them before. So to not have worked on those things and talked about those things as a buildup, as a, as a preparation for the ownership transition, uh, really creates a lot of risk and, uh, and, and uh, a lot of risk in an area that you absolutely don't want to fail at because, uh, you know, that's, that's part of this uh, fulfilling next adventure is, um, is that you have that time to spend time with family, to do some things philanthropically perhaps, to reconnect with your community. But, um, but your spouse, again, has likely played a significant role for you during the business ownership time and so needs to prepare for and go through a transition right side by side with a lot of communication going on and uh, and you both come out the other side ready to take it on ready to uh, thrive in that next adventure thank you i just want to welcome everyone and and a reminder that um, if you have any questions for Marshall, John or Jim, please do use the chat function um, and you can send them directly to Worth Media or to me, Juliet Scott Croxford, and, and we'll, um, we'll build them into the conversation. I, moving beyond the sort of spouse and partner, you, you talk about how important it is to have a transition team in place. Um, John, can you just elaborate 
a bit on that and, and why is the transition team um, different or, or why possibly should it be different from the advisors that you've, you've previously worked with on a day-to-day -day basis in, in the business? Sure. Yeah, I mean, most successful business owners have a really solid team of advisors that they've worked with for many years and, and uh, really helped them with the day-to-day -day matters that might come up, whether it's their attorney on legal matters, their accountant, uh, you know, insurance advisor, all of them contributing to the ongoing uh, management and running of the business. When you start talking about transitioning the ownership of the business, um, there's still those, those needs in place. You still need legal uh, account uh, tax and, and insurance, but, but there are additional needs and additional expertise that you wanna make sure are represented on this, you know, many call it the deal team. And so the deal team can certainly include your existing team, but as you enter into the uh, exit planning process, you got to think about whether they truly have that expertise that's going to be needed, and and uh, and there are there's true expertise that that for many it's not likely that they have things like business valuation. You know, there is in some cases there are, but not often somebody who's looking at the value of the business, what's driving the value of the business, how does the business sit within an industry. So business valuation is really critical, especially as they think about you know what's my number. And many deals don't get done because the owner has this idea of how much it's worth and the market's not ready for that. <laughs> and uh, so it's important to sort of set that through a business valuation thing. The, um, another part of that is a quality of earnings, another important component uh, where you, the business owner, through this expert can uh, really shake down the earning, the historic earnings and show a potential buyer that these are good earnings. If there's any wiggle room in there, you've addressed it, you've looked at it, you understand it. So quality of earnings is another thing that uh, that may need to, you know, likely needs to be introduced. Who's going to help you with the marketing and sale of the business? You know, it's, it's a closely held business. Uh, it's within an industry, but what is the market for that business? And you need some expertise, whether it's investment banker or, uh, or business broker who can basically create a market for your business. They're going to go out there, do the research, make the connection, priority have the connections where they're going to bring your business to market and you want them to help you not only find the, the most value, but also the right, you know, the right uh, partner to go forward. Uh, for many of our business owners, it's not just about the money. It is about uh, culture. It is about, uh, uh, you know, what the, the terms of the deal, it's about what happens to the community and my employees afterwards. So an investment banker, business broker, they're going to help you in finding that correct partner. Um, even within the legal team uh, and the legal representation that you have, um, you know, merger and acquisition legal work is distinct and and uh, you really want somebody who's got a lot of experience with that because things are going to come up different than the day-to-day -day legal matters. Um, certainly wealth management, uh, we talked about you know managing that financial company that comes out of the sale of the operating company and for many, and this is one of the things we address in the book, for many business owners they wait until the deal is done and then they're like, okay, now I'm going to go find somebody to help me with this. And they start working with a wealth advisor who asks, starts asking questions about, well, you know, did you think about doing this leading up to the transaction? Did you, you know, have you looked at whether this financial company that came out of the sale of government company, can that support all the things that you want to do? Not only, you know, me and my lifestyle, but also philanthropy, the community, the, all the other things that you're thinking about doing. And, and so, you know, and getting a wealth manager on board early in the process to help you with that personal clock that Marshall talked about is so important. And, um, and there are exit planning advisors out there, uh, experts in, in really managing that entire team. Um, and, and it's not sort of day to day, do what I'd say to do, but it's really, there's so, so much expertise there, but who's gonna bring it all together and understand the overlaps and make sure that they 
are complementary in the work that they're doing and there's not sort of going off in different directions. So another person who can really add a lot of value in, in a successful business transition. And, and, and from transition, um, we have a question around post-transition. Uh, Marshall, what are some of the examples of post-transition activities that have helped to ensure a successful next adventure? That, that's probably the biggest challenge for business owners, and, and, and it takes time to identify that. But, but a, a foundation of, of our approach is that business owners have a lot of passion. And that's why they are entrepreneurial. They, they have great energy and belief and passion. And that, ha that, that needs to find a new destination. Those destinations vary and they're not always obvious. Uh, some business owners think that they're finally going to have the chance to, to play golf or to sail or do whatever they might wanna do that they've always wished they had a little more time to do. But in truth, what, what business owners really need to, to look for and, and hopefully find is something substantive that will capture not only their time and their energy, but their heart. And it means uh, perhaps becoming a mentor or a coach for other uh, entrepreneurs or pursuing a life goal, like becoming a, a life master in bridge or joining the board of a nonprofit or of another corporation so that you stay engaged in the same kinds of activities. Another is developing your own talent in terms of maybe you're a musician and you've always wanted to uh, become part of a musical group or a musical uh, enterprise, or you have some latent uh, artistic talent and want to become a painter or a potter. The other, and I think a really important opportunity is to actively volunteer. There are lots of organizations, whether you're talking about the Red Cross or the Boys and Girls Club, it, it crosses a, a broad spectrum within your community or within the larger community of our country who are really uh, dying for ambitious, thoughtful, experienced volunteers to make their organizations go and to make them better. And the, that type of, of hands-on engagement really leads to one of the core pieces of what will, what will feel like success following the sale of the business, which is social engagement, social connection. When you sell the business, you lose a lot of your social connections. And rebuilding that social structure is, whether it's with your family or with your partner or spouse, but importantly in your community, rebuilding a new social structure is, is going to be extremely valuable and helpful to making you feel like you have a fulfilled life after the sale of the business. And can you share some, uh, some stories or examples of, of business ownership transitions that that perhaps didn't go so well. Who wants to take that one? Jim, you want to go with that one? <laughs> well, sure. I mean, we can't share specific client stories, but um, let me let me address it a couple ways. Um, Marshall has touched on the planning for and thinking about your new identity when you come out on the other side of the transition. And where we have uh, found in, in, in our experience where that hasn't worked well, um, a, typical, um, a typical result is what we refer to as hibernation. Um, a, a business owner will come out the other side and, and not really have any clue as to what their purpose in life is. Uh, their whole identity has been wrapped up in running a business, um, solving problems, uh, interacting with um, you know, vendors and, and employees, um, in the community and being, you know, a member of the community and good, not only good standing, but a respected member of the community, sitting on boards, whatever. And all of a sudden, um, on the other side, the phone stops ringing, the emails stop coming, and, and the identity has just been gutted uh, by no longer being a business owner. You're now a former business owner, and that doesn't sound very exciting. Um, so without proper 
planning as to what that's going to look like and what your opportunities for engagement and purposeful living are, um, you wind up just hunkered down and not wanting to engage socially. Um, so that, that's not healthy. It's not healthy for relationships and the family. It's certainly not helpful, healthy for you individually. Um, and to the extent that, as John pointed out, you, know, you, you have responsibility to run a financial company, but you're ill-equipped to do that. Um, and if you don't have a purposeful life um, around you, then, then what's the purpose of running that financial company? And you can end up making poor financial decisions, which have an impact not only perhaps on you and your immediate family, but depending on the amount of wealth involved could have an impact on generations to come. I'd like to take the other side of that question and instead of talking about failures, you know, talk about successes. Um, and, I, and I think the, um, the, to, to encapsulate the, the steps that are necessary so you can ensure a successful transition, we break them down basically into five steps. And I think um, John and Marshall and myself have touched on each of these, but um, sequentially, first of all, you've got to know where you're going. So if you're gonna have a successful transition, you have to have a goal setting process where you really understand what the purpose of the transition is going to be. What is the family's vision? What's the family's mission going to be? Um, what kind of future um, is going to be on the other side of this? Uh, what do you wanna accomplish with the liquidity that's been generated? Um, you've devoted 30, 40 years of your life and your family's life into creating this company. Um, so what's the purpose of this? What are your goals for the, for the next adventure? So that goal setting process is very important. It's where you re-engage with the family um, and you make sure, and we certainly recommend that every, every member of the family that's gonna be impacted by the sale has a seat at the table. Um, this is where um, the business owner can um, understand perhaps uh, better than they have in the past as to what the um, objectives of the of the family are what their expectations they are around that around the sales. So that's the goal setting process, which is both a personal process and a family process. The next step, the second step of a successful transition, <clears throat> is the pre-transition planning. And this is Marshall talked um, about the three clocks. And this is basically where you do all the work to bring the three clocks together. And again, the personal and family clock being the one this book deals mostly with but making all of the decisions you have to do from a business standpoint to make sure the business is ready to go as well. Um, so knowing where you're going, i.e. setting the goals, doing the proper work to prepare the business and your family, you can't do a lot with the industry, but um, aligning those three clocks, that's prior to the, to the transition itself. And then as John pointed out, um, you know, the deal team is really important because once you get to the transition, you want to make sure you've got as qualified or more qualified experts on your team as the buyer is going to have on their team. Uh, so that does involve the M&A attorneys and the tax accountants and the business valuation experts and things like that, um, that are gonna be very important to make sure the structure of the deal uh, is consistent with the goals that you have set for the future. Um, and again, Mar um, John said that, that uh, it's frequently not or maybe it's Marshall, frequently said it's not the amount of money or the max amount of money that gets the deal, it's the structure that gets the deal. So that is the third step of a successful transition is making sure this deal structure is right and that the, um, the acquirer is the right acquirer and is going to meet the long-term goals of the family. Um, the fourth step is that immediate post-transition um, piece that Marshall touched upon. This is where you've got to get the financial company up and running properly. You have to have your cash flow uh, forecasts, you know, understand what they are. You have to have your asset allocation correct, your investment plan in place. You have to update your estate plan. Um, all of the insurance coverages, health insurance, all of these things that are necessary to get that company, that financial company up and running well. And then the last step really is this life balance. Uh, and we talk a lot about the life balance and Marshall touched on that as well, finding a purpose in life an outlet for your entrepreneurial energy and the reason for, um, for the, the remainder of your life. And we'll, you know, we can touch about that. We talk a lot about legacy and legacy building in that, in that framework. So that's a successful transition. When you go through those steps, you're going to have a successful transition. 
and 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 we will come we will come on to legacy shortly. Um, I I've had um, two two questions from from the audience. John, one is specifically about how how someone should approach dealing with family members who are against the idea of selling the family business, and any advice there on 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 how you navigate that. So family is the is the can be the most challenging aspect especially a, a family business that's run through multiple generations and that's that's usually you get that dispersed ownership maybe some members of the family who have remained involved and then other members of the family who aren't involved but have some ownership and so um so you run into some situations where everybody's on board and and um you know, and you get through it through some great communication and work together. And then there's others where it just breaks down. And uh, and what you want to do is much like we're advocating the T minus five that Marshall's talking about with family. You know, it goes back generations that so you got to start working on this. But but you can you know start working on it as early as you can. You got to keep the family uh, in involved, engaged, and and share communication um, so that you can uncover the sticking points that you might run into, uh, and there's going to be some, and you can address them as best you possibly can uh, through the process. We talked about, I talked about the, the, uh, the deal team and the advisor team. There is a, a cottage industry out there and an effective and impactful cottage industry out there that deals with families and family businesses and they are the psychologist psychiatrist i mean they they deal with sort of this really soft stuff this this uh, relational stuff and um and we've found and we've helped to introduce some of them to our fam the family businesses that we've come across so that uh, so that you've got that that third voice that independent voice who is playing referee, who is, uh, uh, you know, leading the conversation, uh, getting you over hurdles and things like that. So again, it is, it can be really, really tough. Um, but, um, but and, and proactively how, how dealing with it is, is, uh, much like all of this, it's really communication and proactively going after it as early as you possibly can. And how much did your own experience being in a family business inform the writing of this book? John. <laughs> so who's on here who knows my history? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so you know, again, I, I uh, uh, lived through it um, with, you know, this business that my grandfather started, then passed it down, you know, three boys, one of them couldn't, couldn't work for dad. So he left and started his own business one and the two remaining, my dad being one of them, um, ran the business. But they reached a point where, you know, the decision was made that uh, that things needed to change and they needed a partner and there was disagreement there. And so um, it was a tough, long, tough process that they went through. Uh, and it took a lot out of the family, took a lot out of my dad, took a lot out of uh, everybody involved. And and they they likely could have benefited from reaching out to more advisors who could have helped them <laughs> but they got through it they got through it and uh you know and we can all talk to each other today but uh but yeah it's uh it can be the most challenging aspect of all of this and marshall i have a question which is sort of contextually about the time that we're currently in um during covid and the pandemic um i i think you were quoted recently um regarding it now is still a good time for sellers to move forward with a transaction why do you think that is and any advice for sellers thinking about selling their business during this time well certainly the pandemic is changing the world and there's no question about that it's changing family life is changing the business life and from my perspective the the pandemic is at a minimum should be a catalyst to encourage business owners to think about their plan and to think about their business and to think about their family and to begin that process because the business world is, is changing. As, we've, as we are experiencing today, technology is going to be a more significant component 
of virtually every business on the planet. And it's going to change workflows and it may change geographies. This is really going to be the beginning of a more significant period of change in our, in our business environment. And for some businesses, it will be a distinct advantage. There is a very bright uh, silver lining to this. For other businesses, it, it may create change which is more problematic. And uh, so every business owner should think about the post-pandemic world will scale be an even greater advantage and how can their business and their enterprise be uh, engaged going forward either within the family with the next generation who has the energy to face these new challenges or is it more realistic to look for a business partner a merger partner or a sale where it's more clear that the opportunity to uh, realize the value of the business and perhaps the, the energy of the family that's been put into the business, perhaps for generations, that, that the opportunity to recognize that value may in fact uh, be enhanced coming out of this pandemic. But now is the time to start thinking and planning and being proactive and being bold, not retreating and not putting off uh, the hard work that we've been talking about, but, but really moving forward with that. And, and clearly some businesses are going to be advantaged coming out of this in, in the world as it changes. And you want to be proactive and ready to take advantage of that. And, and I, just moving on to sort of finding purpose post transition and, and, and this sort of notion of legacy. Um, and there's a lovely quote in the book um, that it says, we learned early on that there's a difference between the resume you build for your work and the resume you build for your life. Um, can you just talk a little bit about um, sort of purpose and legacy, Jim, and, and, and what factors play into thinking about that? You, thank, yes. Um, you know, we all have a legacy and we're all going to leave a legacy whether we want to or not. Um, uh, we were going to be remembered for something or we're going to be remembered for many things. Um, you know, by the time a business owner reaches the point in their life where they're going to transition their business, they probably already built a portion of their legacy. Um, we encourage um, our business owner clients to think honestly and objectively about what they've built and, and how they are perceived, um, what they're proud of, um, where they may still have some work to do, or perhaps even a legacy to, to repair, you know, depending on what their relationships are with their family. Um, you know, these thoughts will come naturally to people later in life, um, but when you've got 10, 20, 30 years still uh, ahead of you, there's a tremendous opportunity um, to you know, burnish your the legacy that you've already built, perhaps without thinking you know, too much about it, or maybe even to reinvent the narrative entirely. Um, so again, we're all going to have a legacy. It's a question of whether we want to take control of that legacy um, and how we how we want it to how we want to be remembered, not only by our family but by by the community um, in large. You know, I, a great example, I think, of this that we don't often think about is, uh, is Dickens' Ebenezer Scrooge. You know, we, when we think about Scrooge, we think of, uh, you know, a hard-nosed businessman who is um, argumentative and isolated and, you know, not really a very nice person. But, but the arc of the story ends with his redemption. Um, and in fact, that's a great example, not that business clients are all Scrooges, but that's a great example of how someone can take uh, active control of their legacy and reinvent themselves, which comes back to purposeful living, comes back to um, taking control of what that next adventure is all about. Um, you know, and I'm not speaking when I talk about legacy, I've never mentioned money. And some people think that, you know, the legacy you leave behind is how much money you leave behind and, you know, uh, you know what kind of good works you do with your money. Well, the good works are part of it. But this really isn't about inheritance. When we think about legacy, we think about the values and accomplishments um, that you have been able to accumulate 
um, and you know what you have done to serve others, something other than yourself. And this comes back to the quote um, about a life resume, you know, versus a professional resume. Um, and it's how you're going to be remembered at your service and years afterwards. It's really important and the integral, the, the most important part of building a legacy. And Marshall, can you get for those uh, that are on on that perhaps have have recently gone through a, a a business transaction like this and a transition like this? Can you give some pointers on how someone can get started in thinking about legacy if 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 it hasn't really been part of their thought process so far? And like, what should what should be an entrepreneur's main goal post transition? How should they think about that? Well, as, as Jim was saying, legacy really is not about finances, usually. It's about your relationship and what you leave of value for others, whether it's within your family or your community or with your employees and your other business and in industry colleagues. And success in that regard really is a function of the relationships that you have, and listening to others who know you. I think one of the most important elements to understand about this is this transaction's bigger than the business owner and it's going to impact the family, his or her spouse or partner, the employees. There's a, there's a larger impact. And I know as a business owner, and, and I can speak in the first person, that uh, you, you, tend, you tend to focus on your own challenges, but you need to step outside of yourself as a business owner if you want to think about your legacy and, and understand better the role that the business has played in the lives of many other people. And, and it may be your grandchildren, or it may be your extended family, or it may be the community. And a successful transition is when you've been able to move through that transition, move past the hibernation period that Jim was talking about, which there's almost almost an inevitable period of letdown after you close the transaction because it's, it's been building to a crescendo in terms of the intensity of your focus and the work and getting, getting that transaction closed or the transition within the family closed. But coming out the other side, it's a it's often usually about the success of your ability to have strong relationships, whether they're within your family, within your community, within your business colleagues following the sale. Those relationships, the strength of those and your engagement will be both important to you and also be a very substantive part of that legacy that you leave behind. And so, while finances are important, and certainly, as Jim suggested, uh, many will come to you hoping that, that your philanthropic ambitions will fall in their direction, uh, in truth, for you and your family, it's about relationships. It's not really about the finances. Thank you. And, and John, I, I, there's another question here um, as, as, we, as we bring this conversation to a close. Around, what was your favorite thing about writing this book? Favorite thing about writing the book was, uh, was really the outreach that we did to interview advisors and business owners about this, you know, this idea that we had. The idea being, uh, you know, there's there's many advisors out there dealing with the transition of the business ownership, the business itself, but there's this gap and, and this need for help uh, with the business owner and their family to get them ready and to, and to move them through the transition process. So we had this idea, you know, it was informed because we've had many conversations uh, ourselves, but we went out and did these interviews and, and uh, and we were we were really um, explicit about wanting when we're talking to a business owner we want the spouse there we want both their the feedback and so uh, you know a, a much more informed interview talking to both of them together and seeing their reactions and and uh, you know how they each felt about the process that they've gone through uh, what worked what didn't work so um, 
so it's it's that face to face sort of seeing the reactions uh, and uh, for the and really you know confirming this hunch that we had that uh, that this was really an unmet need that would be uh, beneficial to uh, focus on in a book and, and in the work that we do. And and Jim, did you learn anything um, new or unexpected in doing this book and having these these conversations with with um, different business owners? I'm not sure there are any aha moments, but what it did do was force us to think, um, uh, you know, honestly about what we were doing and and um, and how the pieces fit together. So I think in doing this, we ended up becoming better advisors. Um, you know, uh, we work closely together and, you know, John brings a set of experience, you know, to the table and Marshall does and I do. And by collaborating on this book, I think we all learn from each other. Um, and when we would bring an idea to the table to talk about it, we sometimes started um, in a certain position, we wound up in a different position. And we wound up just through the process of thinking through um, the experiences that we've all had and how these pieces fit together. So I can't um, identify a, a specific instance, but I know that we um, are thinking evolved in the writing of this book. Um, so, so that was important. The only, the aha moment that I had or what I really get out of writing this book, not so much writing it, was what happened when it was done. And um, I gave a copy of this book to a, uh, not a client of ours, but it's somebody who sits on the board who has been a very successful businessman and has since sold his business and um, is um, and you know is, has a private foundation and a very successful individual. And he read the book um, and he he called me up afterward and he said, Jim, I wish I had this book before I sold my business because I would have done it differently. <laughs> so <laughs> then I then I knew that we'd done a good job. Yeah, that's very good affirmation. Um, and, and Marshall, bring, bring us to a close. What, what's the one thing that you hope readers will take away from the book once they've read it? I, I hope they, they understand that they need to start planning early and that the benefits of planning early and thoughtfully will accrue not only to themselves, but very importantly to their family and to their spouse or partner understanding that communication along the way, and I think John alluded to that in his family's uh, circumstances, communicate along the way, help people understand how you're thinking, listen to how they are thinking, and that communication over a period of time is what really builds the foundation for a successful transition of the business. Marshall, Jim and John, thank you so much for such an in insightful and engaging conversation. Um, I, I really did enjoy the book um, and I'm glad I've, I've read it prior to um, hopefully selling a business one day. Um, thanks again to our sponsoring partner, The Colony Group, and most importantly, thanks to all of you that have tuned in today uh, and for the great questions. We hope you found it useful and insightful. Please do share any feedback with us. We'd love to hear your comments. You can email us at communityatworth.com. Um, and particularly if you're thinking of releasing a book anytime soon that you'd like us to consider for a future book event, please also email us. Again, it's communityatworth.com. Um, for those that, that registered and provided your mailing address, you will be receiving um, a copy of the book um, complimentary from the Colony Group uh, over the coming weeks. So look out for that. And if you're a sports fan and you're interested in joining us tomorrow at 3 p.m. for our next normal series, we're joined by Commissioner Don Garber uh, from Major, Major League Soccer to discuss what the future of sports will look like for fans, teams and owners. So you can register for that online at worth forward slash events. Thank you again. Um, th thank you, speakers, Marshall, John, Jim, you, you were really great. Um, and it's been a, a, a fascinating topic of conversation. Um, and in the meantime, stay healthy and well and enjoy the rest of your day.